Yes, he is. I'm talking about my God. Can we just sing a little bit of that? Come on, lift your voice. Help me out, team. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yes. He's a good God. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Does anybody feel that? Come on, all over the house. Sing, my God. My God. Yes, he is. Talking about. Oh. I know that he is good God talking. Come on and bless him in the house today. Come on and bless him in the house today. He's a good God. Yes, he is. He is a good God. Yes, he is. Talking about my God. You may be seated. You may be seated. Amen. To our pastor, Elder Parks, to all of the ministers, deacons, and everyone here. Amen. Elder Hicks, I would have been there, but duty called, but my prayers were with you. Amen. Tasha, it's so good to see you again back here. Amen. 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 And Elder Speed, it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure to see Elder Speed. Amen. She's been a mentor. She's been my mom at the time. She's been my sister at the time. She's been whatever it is you needed her to be, whatever it is I needed her to be at that moment. Amen. 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 I'm going to tell you something real quick. If you've never spoken to her, she can get real deep. I'm telling you, from experience, I'm telling you. Amen. Have to go and look at yourself in the mirror. Absolutely. She'll tell you some things, but it's always a pleasure to all of you. Amen. Amen. Libra, my brother right there, it's good to see you. Absolutely. Amen. Um, uh, Revelation chapter 3. We're going to read from verses 14 to 22. Ask everyone that can, everyone that can to please stand. I'm reading from the New International Version, so it may read a little differently. <clears throat> When you have it, say amen. If you don't have it, say, Lord, help me. Well, amen. It's the last book of the Bible. Revelation chapter 3. Amen. Revelation chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, and it reads, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the amen the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich and I have acquired wealth and don't need anything, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and open the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down with my father on his throne. Whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. You may be seated. My topic or my task today is to discuss and make applicable for us today the correlation between the church of today and the lukewarm church. When we consider the writing, or rather the way this text is written, there are some concerns that come to mind. One of them being that we have to take inventory over the type of church that we claim to be. 
Because as you sit back and you consider the church as it is today, and I'm not just talking about Samaritan, but you can observe churches, there is less transforming and there's more conforming. We have missed the task. Our job was to transform others into what God has called them to be. Not of ourselves, but by way of the Holy Ghost, to transform others. But what has seemed to have happened over time is rather than transform, we've become like the world. Have I got a witness here? When you step back and think about it, there are just some things, not even that long ago, I can remember when I was a boy, there were just some things in church that would not go on. It just would not happen. You, you, you wouldn't do it, and you wouldn't hear about it, and if it did happen, it was corrected. And it was not brought out front, and everybody got embarrassed. No, the correction just happened, and you carried on your merry way in the right way. But now what is seeming to happen is that we have an lackadaisical attitude as to say, it's okay. You know, almost as if to say, whatever, uh, I, I still come to church. The verse, the last verse 22, I want to talk about that, where it says, he who ha whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The problem I have with that is that the writer is not talking to the world. Read the scripture. He is talking to the church. So the question that pops in my mind is how is it that the people of God don't hear them? How is that possible? My sons hear my voice and they know when daddy is talking. Whether they want to hear me or not. Whether I say something to them that they like or do not like. Ten men can line up and call their names, but they only one of them will be called daddy. They recognize my voice. So if you belong to me and I know that you are my sons and you're my daughters, when I speak, you ought to be able to hear. So I had to study because that didn't make sense to me. So I looked at the word ears. And I had to use a thesaurus. I don't even know if anybody else even uses a thesaurus anymore. But I, I had to use a thesaurus because I'm a little old, spirited. So I got a thesaurus and I found out uh, some different synonyms for the word ears. Because a lot of times when you read the scripture, uh, sometimes it speaks in metaphors and it speaks in anthropomorphisms and things like that. It doesn't literally mean that. Like when it says, oh, taste and see, it doesn't mean that you go take a bite out of God and see if he tastes good. That's not what that means. It means try him. So I had to do some study about the word is and synonyms that I came up with was consciousness. To be conscious of something. When you consider that word, another one also pops up and it says to have a heart to hear for. The word hear, a synonym for that, is to pay attention. So when you put the text in context that scripture could very well read, uh, whoever has a heart for me, let them pay attention to what I'm saying. When you step back then and consider what this verse is saying, it is very much so possible to have ears and not hear. You can have two functional working ears and still can't hear. Have I got a witness here? All the married people keep your attention on me. You can have ears and not hear. That don't mean that I don't love you. That doesn't mean I'm not conscious that you're there. That doesn't mean that I don't have a heart for you. I'm just not paying attention to what you're saying. So now the scripture makes sense because I have had times in my life where I have a heart for God. I love God. I love his word. But sometimes when he spoke, I wasn't paying attention. So now I understand why the writer says, if you got an ear, let him hear. See, it's not enough just to have a heart, but when God speaks, you got to listen. I've learned the most about God since being a father. It makes sense to me how he operates and works. God is not as so mysterious, mystical and mysterious as we would like him to be. He's actually rather basic and practical. 
for the part of him he allows us to see. When my son Elijah finds out that he has done something to make me upset, he will make up a song for me and climb into my lap and kiss me on my head. He knows daddy's mad. He knows daddy didn't like what he did. But because he know I got a heart for that boy, he knows that he still has access to me. Brian once will sometimes will come up to me when he did something that made me upset, he'll come up to me and say, Daddy, do you still love me? I give him a kiss and I say, yes, I love you, but you made me mad. He said, okay, good. <laughs> the point I'm trying to make with that is that my sons recognize what it is I want them to do and what it is I don't want them to do. They know when they've done something to make daddy upset. They know what daddy has said. When you go to school, pay attention to the teacher. When the teacher tells you to sit down, sit down. When mama tells you to go over there, you go over there. Don't touch this, don't do this, and don't do that. And so they understand when they've broken my law. They understand that when they've done something, there have been times when they did something wrong and I didn't even know, and I didn't have to open my mouth. Just my face made them feel sorry. Yeah, act like y'all ain't got kids. Am I the only one? Just, my, just me walking into a room just, just makes them fall on their knees. I'm telling you, they, they, they just get so, so afraid and beside themselves because they know they've done wrong. The problem is, and, 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 and the correlation is that that is many of us today. We know what God's law is. We know what he's told us to do. We know what we are planning at. We know what we've been taught. It's just that we are not paying attention to what it is he's saying. It's not enough to just have a heart because you can have a, a heart to do the right thing and still be wrong. And as a result, what we've done as a church is trade in what it is we know about the Word of God to how it is we feel about what the Word of God says. And I want to tell you right now that the Word of God is not based upon how you feel. If every time the preacher preaches and you leave saying, oh, that felt good, I like that, then you got to check yourself. Because every sermon should not be a good sermon. It ought to be some homework you got to go back and do. It ought to be some repenting you have to do. It ought to be some forgiving you have to do. It ought to be some fasting and praying that you have to do. Every sermon ain't like that. In our churches, we recognize God because we have a heart for him. Be conscious of his existence and know he's there. And so what happens a whole lot of times is that when God moves in one place, we tend to think that that is the only place where God will be. And because complacency, uh, uh, comfortability builds complacency, when God moves, we misses it. So when God says, I'm a, when God does a great work in this area, and then he takes a step to the right, and we're not paying attention to what he's saying, that gives the devil a foothold. Yeah, right. And so what the devil says is, I, 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 I can't come back to them that same way that I did the first time, because the first time I came over there, daddy was right there, and daddy told his kids, you see that? Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't say that. Don't think that. Don't act that way, because I call that sin. And when you sin against me, I have to step away from you. I need you to pay attention to me. That's called the devil. That's called wrong. So don't do that. And so the devil knows that. And he says, I can't come to them that way because they'll see me because of what daddy said. So what the devil does now then is the same sin, but he dresses it up and makes it less threatening. It makes it more inviting. It makes it seem to be okay. It's still sin and wrong, but it ain't like the way he came last time. But we don't see it because we're too busy having a heart only, but not moving when he moves. I didn't say God changes, but God does move. From Genesis all the way to Revelation where it says, even so come, Lord Jesus, there's the continuity of thought of God moving like wind and rushing like water, ascending on a cloud and flying back to heaven. God is constantly moving all through the text, but he didn't change. So the message is, you have to have a heart for God, but hear him and pay attention well enough so that when he moves, you stay in step. When he moves, you stay in step. Every time God moves, you stay in step. You don't want to be out of step with God because you'll miss what it is he's trying to say to his church. As a result of us missing what it is he's trying to say to his church, the abnormal has become normal. 
So much so to the point to where it's almost as if we don't even recognize sin anymore. Wrong has become right. Oh, uh, 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 when, 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 when a young lady in the church, been raised in the church all her life, and gets pregnant, has a child out of wedlock, the first thing you want to do is congratulate her. Oh, y'all can say, man, I know I'm right. The first thing you want to do is congratulate and make it seem as if that's okay. Uh, uh, when we have a young dude that just got out of jail, the first thing you want to do is throw him a get out of jail free, a get out of jail party. Man, wait, man, this, this, this dude done had three parties already. Ain't nobody done stepped up and said, dude, what are you doing with your life? Ain't nobody stepped up and said, sister, wait a minute. Then before you have another baby again, you got to get married first. And, and we, we almost missed the point of us being here and being the salt of the earth. Less transforming and there's, been, there's become more conforming to the world. So when we look at the text, we see where the issue really is. The issue is that people who have been planted right, it is suggested that the person who planted the church at Laodicea wasn't a, was a, a disciple of Paul. And if we know about Paul, we definitely know that that man was one who rightly divided. So if anybody came up under him, you know that that person had to know the scripture. So it's not like the church was planted in Laodicea as a church who did not know the ways of God. They knew the way of God. But the question now is what happened that caused them to conform to the city and not stick to what it is that was in which they were planted in? Here's what happened. At the time at Laodicea, they had a, a ruler there. He was kind of looked at as a God king. Okay, during that time, first century area. There was a ruler there who was looked at as a god king, and his rule was that y'all would worship me. There were some people there that still stayed with God and still believed, with, believed in God, but those folk were being persecuted. But what was happening is they were saying that if you are not uh, 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 praising this god king, then what I'll do is strip away whatever rights you have here in this area. It almost gives us a depiction of how end times would be when the Antichrist comes and we have to receive the mark of the beast in order to buy and sell and trade and goods. Laodicea was a rich area because it was, right, it, it was situated in such a way to where at the harbor boats can come up and you can buy and sell and trade and most of the banking was happening in Laodicea. So Laodicea was rich and for most part, everybody in Laodicea was rich. And so people didn't want to give up their money in order to follow God. That, the, here, here, here it is, the issue in our, in our church we have today. We, don't, we, we would definitely trade in what it is we know to be true for how it is other people feel about us. We would rather stay bound and stay undelivered because of what it will look like in the eyes of other people. We will deny God and then bring in man and do everything man says even if it costs us our life. So God says because you know what the right thing to do is because you knew my law because you heard me and you disobeyed I will spit you out of my mouth I'll spit you out of my mouth because it's different if you didn't know if you didn't know I could understand now I have to teach you but because you were planted in my law and you knew right from wrong you are conscious of your sin you completely understand what it is you are doing. You completely know that what I'm telling you, what I was telling you to do was the wrong thing to do. And so many of us are like that today. We live a lifestyle completely contradictory to what it is that was told and taught to us. And as a result of us living the lifestyle of what it is completely contradictory told to us, we wind up teaching a doctrine that's erroneous. We wind up preaching a doctor that ain't got nothing to do with what God told us to do. It has nothing to do with what it is God has taught us and what it is he showed us and what it is he's revealed to us. We, can, we end up preaching what it is we feel rather than what it is we know the word of God says. And because we know most folk ain't going to go home and study anyway, we got people saying amen to foolishness. Stuff that ain't got nothing to do with the Holy Ghost. Stuff that ain't got nothing to do with God. It has all to do with what I think about God and what, not what it is I know about God. Making churches out of our own names and not putting God back on the throne. Have I got a witness here? I know I'm right about it because I've seen it before. 
I've seen where it is, uh, uh, where, where it is. When I was younger, I would see people glad and, and happy in the Holy Ghost, not afraid to give God praise, not afraid to shout, speaking in tongues, laying on hands, and rightly dividing the word of truth. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, this new doctrine came along. There ain't nobody taught you. You ain't never heard in the church. But all of a sudden, this thing came along. Lukewarmness. Because the people that talk to me, I love them and I agree with them and they're my family and this is this person and that's that person. Wait a minute. What about what God said? What about what it is you were taught? What about what the Holy Ghost says? So as a result, preachers end up preaching with no power behind them. Preachers end up teaching with no power behind them. You wonder why you ain't casting out no devil? You ain't got no power behind you. You wonder why you can't interpret nothing no more? You ain't got no power behind you. You wonder why you can't see the visions like you used to see them? There's no power behind you. To the church at Laodicea, write these things. Then I got this one thing against you. That you ain't neither hot nor cold. You're lukewarm. Anybody ever had some lukewarm coffee? That's, mess, that's some nasty stuff. Anybody ever just had some cold food? That, that, that's not no good stuff. Try, try eating some cold meatloaf. That stuff is disgusting. You don't want to eat no cold meatloaf, cold collard greens and all that type of stuff. You want to spit that stuff out. It is time for us to get hot for God again. So as a lack of you knowing but not doing, I'll spit you out of my mouth. I'll spew you out. And because the abnormal has become normal, the text uh, clearly tells us that we don't even know who we are anymore. We think we're wonderful. We think we're beautiful. We think we're rich. And we think we got it going on. All because we said something that sounded good and got a few amens and a pat on the back. But the scripture says you are blind, you are pitiful, you are naked. I have learned that just because folks say amen don't always mean you was right. Just because everybody say go ahead and preach, boy, that ain't always mean you're doing the right thing. You got to follow what the Holy Ghost says. Because I tell you right now, if you move without the Holy Ghost, you'll make a fool out of yourself. You will think you got some power and you ain't got no power. You think you're going somewhere and you ain't going nowhere to the church at Laodicea. Write these things. That you are neither hot nor cold. You're this way one way and that way the other day. There's no, uh, uh, there, there's no uh, 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 stick to itiveness in your spirit. Uh, uh, how come only the people that know you saved is the folk at your church? But if I go to work, then hey, who, who, who go to church? He didn't go to church. If I go down at the job, don't nobody know you saved. If I go over your homeboy or your homegirl house, she, he or she never knew you were saved. Hot nor cold. God said, I wish you was either one or the other. It is hard to serve God when you sleep with the devil. How you gonna serve God and sleep with the devil? How you gonna serve God? How you gonna preach the word? And then denounce and defy the Holy Ghost. How you gonna serve God and then not believe what the scripture says about God? Not wanting to rightly divide, but divide according to what it is you believe. Maybe y'all ain't never heard of about it. I saw somebody do that before. I have. I, I'm preaching for what it is I know. You can't preach without the Holy Ghost. You can't rightly divide without the Holy Ghost. You can't speak to people and without the Holy Ghost. You can't interpret nothing without the Holy Ghost. You don't see nothing without the Holy Ghost. And then at the same time, call yourself being with the devil. You can't do both. How can we serve two masters? We can't do both of them. So the writer says that this is a lukewarm church. A lukewarm church signifies that this is a church that can't really make up their mind what you want to do. On one Sunday, we real hot, then the next Sunday we get real cold because such and such ain't here. The pastor didn't show, so we decide we don't want to have church and glorify God. Or one person comes and we decide we're not going to stand up and clap and shout and give God praise because your best uh, sister, your best brother didn't come to church. I, I'm going to praise God. I'm, I'm going to praise God one Sunday, but I won't praise him this Sunday because they didn't let me lead my favorite song. Uh, she didn't let me do this and he didn't let me do that. What type of church are you? Are you going to serve God 
or serve man. Because what has happened is that we've taken God off the throne and putting people up on the throne. And guess what? When the people die, God dies. When the people die, your God dies. So when you really look at it, you're really only serving yourself. Got to ask yourself, what type of church am I? I said, ask yourself, what type of church am I? You have to really look about this thing. Am I living the life God has called me to live? Or am I conforming to those things that he's told me not to do? Daddy, I heard what you said. You said, don't do this. And you said, don't do that. But man, everybody else is doing it and it's working for them. And so we wind up in a position where we don't mind sin because it's kind of working. I still get to sing and do what I want to do because it's working. I still get to teach and preach and do what I want to do because it's working. Yeah, I ain't mad. I can sleep around as much as I want to do. So long as I don't get her pregnant, nobody knows it's still working. I can still do what I want to do because it's working. But God said, you are, the, uh, you, you are, you are either not hot nor cold. You ain't either one of them. God says, I see you. No, they don't see you. They at their own address. They can't see you. No, they don't know. You didn't call them. No, you didn't know. You're not friends on Facebook. But God says, I see you. It's one thing to fight against the devil. You got some power. But what do you do when you're going against God? Who got your back when you go against God? Can't nobody stand up against that. God says, I see you. Help me, Holy Ghost. Says, I see you. You don't even realize that you're wretched pitiful, poor and blind. I counseled you and told you to get in my gold and let me put some salve on your eye, but you denied me. You didn't want to do it. Perfectly okay with coming to church and then leaving the same way you came. Because you don't want to give up what you got to do Sunday evening. We'll come to church and praise God and teach and preach and do what we got to do, but we don't want to give it up to God completely. The devil doesn't mind you shouting. Tell you that. The devil doesn't mind you shouting. I've known people to shout in church and couldn't stand the person they were sitting next to. He don't mind you shouting. Uh, yeah. yeah, you can say amen back to that because I've, I've seen it happen here. You can't stand the person that you're sitting next to, but you don't mind you cutting a step real quick. The devil don't mind you shouting. He doesn't mind you singing. He doesn't mind you teaching. He doesn't mind you preaching so long as what this word don't get in your heart. Because how many know the word of God will break those chains, tap those strongholds, kill those devils and demons that's, that, that, that you got wrestling on the inside? He don't mind you shouting. Keep on shouting. He don't mind you shouting. The devil will not stop you from shouting. He will not stop you from singing. He will not stop you from speaking to people, hugging people, high-fiving and shaking hands. But he want to keep that thing away from you because he knows as soon as the word pierces your heart, you're going to have to start loving again. You're going to have to start speaking again. Those gifts that you got bound up in you will come out. The devil knows these things. He don't mind you shouting. Because I'm a living witness that wants the word of God get a hold of you. A change begins to happen in your life. I'm a living witness that once that thing gets really down on the inside of you, it's like Jeremiah, it's like fire shut up in your bone. Even when you want to sit down, even when you don't want to speak, even when you know that person made you mad, it's still going to want to make you get up and hug him and love on him and forgive him and move on. The lukewarm church. What type of church are we? So because of this issue, that the Lord is telling John to write. I don't know about anybody else, but I have seen myself in all of these churches during this series. Me and Reverend Lindsay was talking, I said, they forgot a few other churches too, because there was some other stuff they could have said. <laughs> but as a result of what the Lord sees at Laodicea on the Isle of Patmos, John, like a student in the classroom, taking out a piece of paper and a pen and sitting down on a stoop in glory and Jesus is talking and he's taking notes and begin to pin these things down what the master is saying. And he tells them, I know your deeds. You can't hide from God. He sees what you're doing. I'm not talking about the works of your hands either, just that. I'm talking about the intention behind the works of your hand. He can see your heart. 
He says, I know your deeds, that you ain't really neither hot or cold. I know you look hot for God, but you're not really doing, you're feeling what it is you really is doing. Uh, you sing for show. You pray for show. You show up for show. You act for show. You teach for show. You, 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 you preach for show. You're not really, what you're doing on the outside is not reflective of what your heart is. God says, tell them down there that I see them, and this is what I got against them. So he begins to pin these things down and write. When we hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church, and pay attention to what it is he's saying, there's no possible way that we can see you and I in this. Have I got a witness here? I'm preaching to myself now because I see myself. Because there have been times and I did walk in here with an attitude. Grab the microphone and started singing or teaching or preaching, knowing full well that my spirit right now was not correct. And it was not right. God said, Brandon, I see you. I'm only talking about me. I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about me. There have been times when I came up in here and the pastor say, Elder, I want you to do this. And I say, yes, sir, pastor. But no, my, spot, my heart wasn't right in it. I see you, Brandon. I see what you're doing. I see how you're acting. I see you when you go around the church to avoid people. I saw you. I don't care what it looked like. I saw you. You're either hot nor cold. Because the Holy Ghost will make you love people. The Holy Ghost will make you act right. The Holy Ghost will make you, will make you put a, a, a leash around your flesh and restrain you and make you uh, straighten up and do what it is God wants you to do. Write these things to the church that I will spit them out of my mouth. I'm trying to keep in line with time and I want to drop this last bit with you. It is historically and archaeologically proven concerning the church at Laodicea. This, what I'm about to say, is not in scripture, but you can find this in an encyclopedia. This is a proven fact. When John had wrote this book, and he got the word from Jesus, that I will spew you out of my mouth, another version says, I will swallow you up. That's what other versions of this same scripture says. I'll swallow you up. It was a warning that if you don't straighten up, I will swallow you up. I said to them, I'll destroy you. I'll take you out, whichever however way you want to look at it. That's what the scripture says. If you don't get hot for God, if you don't return back to what it is, you know what you should have been doing. If you don't get yourself right within my word, I will swallow you up. I'll come get you because you know what it is I've said. You've heard me speaking. See, th th that's, this, 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 this lesson series have definitely moved me uh, 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 a whole lot from a place of always having to need a confirmation from somebody else about the word of God. It has moved me to a spot to where even if you don't come and tell me what it is the Lord has told you to tell me, I know God's voice. And I heard him clearly when he spoke. He said, write to them. If they don't tighten up, I will swallow them up. During this time, this was considered to be the first century church after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Holy Ghost comes, the church begins here. First century. Okay? First century. And it was prophesied here by Christ. We know it's him because he's ascended. And he gives descriptions of himself all throughout the book of Revelation. This is Jesus talking to John. He tells them, I will spit you out, I'll swallow you up, I'll come unto you if you don't repent. First century. A century is 100 years. Archaeologically and historically proven that in the 4th century, the city at Laodicea was destroyed in an earthquake. You can find that in an encyclopedia. You can Google that right now if you wanted to. That is a proven fact that the city was swallowed up. Now here it is. Here it is. And this is a word for us, and I'll take my seat. The city was destroyed. Wait a minute, preacher. I thought you said to the church at Laodicea. The city is destroyed. Why did God take out the whole city when he was only talking to the church? This is a word for us. Because the church was not having the proper impact on the whole region. 
because of their lukewarmness. Because they were not doing what they were supposed to do in the area that God placed them. God said, I'll destroy the whole city. There is not a brick standing at the city. And nobody tried to rebuild it. A century is 100 years. God gave the city 300 years to get right. 300 years. But because of the God King at that time, they decided to follow him because they wanted to keep their money, they wanted to keep their friends, they wanted to keep their relationships, they didn't want to turn because it wasn't cool, it wasn't nice, people would reject me, I don't want to do it. But God said, you know what I taught, I'll give you 300 years to get right. In the fourth century, the city, the city, the entire area that Laodicea was placed in was destroyed. My prayer for us today is that we don't become so much out of place, non-transforming and completely conforming to the world that God says, Samaritan, I can't do nothing with you no more. And so what I'm going to do is not just destroy you, but I'm going to take out between Mac and the boulevard because you were disobedient. You didn't do what I told you to do. You didn't preach what thus saith the Lord. You were not transforming lives. You were not teaching what you was planning. And because you, conta you were contaminated, you contaminated the whole region. Ain't nobody good. I'm going to swallow everybody up. And it won't be a brick left standing. It's just a memory to people who ain't looked at it or studied. Just something, something, something somebody taught in the school. Laodicea was swallowed up in an earthquake. Now scientists and atheists and people who uh, 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 live by the Darwinism of uh, philosophy can come and say whatever it is they want to say about what they think happened, freak accidents, acts of nature, or whatever, but they cannot deny that Jesus said 300 years prior to the earthquake that if you don't tighten up, I will destroy you. That's a prophecy that came to pass. I don't see how anybody can say the Bible ain't true. He said it in the first century. And then by the fourth century, he brought his word to pass, gave him 300 years to get right. Listen, people are not living to the age of 300. So you have to consider to yourself, how much time do you got left? And he swallows you for not repenting. You have to consider to yourself, how long can I keep up this lifestyle doing what I want to do, knowing what God has told me to do, before he says, you know what, I've had enough! It's like when your children do wrong, you say, okay, don't do that again. Okay, don't do that again. Listen, if you do it again, this is what's going to happen. And then he still may give him a break after that. But after a while, grace runs out. Swallowed up, not just the church, but the entire surrounding region. Because they were not moving when he said move. They had a heart for him because they were planted there. They knew, they, they, they knew the word by way, of his, uh, by way of the person who was the, uh, Paul's disciple, who we knew Paul taught the word properly. They knew it, but they were not doing it. Lukewarmness. Playing to God when it was convenient. Doing when God says when it worked for them. And then do it when I wanted to do when it worked for me. God says no. It's either my way or no way. How many of y'all know holiness is still right? How many of y'all know that? How many of you know it's, it, 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 God's way is still the right way? My prayer for anybody here today is that if you feel a tug, that's, that's, that's one of God's moves on your heart. You don't want to miss the move of God. You don't want to be caught up in saying, I came to church today, so that means I love him. And then when he moves, you say, I'm going to sit down and be quiet. No, if God is telling you to move, you move. Whether it be rededicating yourself back to him, whether it be getting saved first for your first time in the first place, whether it means to go to somebody and say, I'm sorry and please forgive me, whether it goes to somebody who you think got something against you and say, if, if I've done you wrong, please forgive me. God is saying, listen, time is short. I'm not giving 300 years anymore. You don't know when I'm coming. Get it right. Let he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church.